You've heard us say it over and over again. If you want to be consistently successful at punching your tag each year, you have to be able to create your own opportunities. For the rifle hunter, that could mean knowing an elk's needs and wants at that time of year. For a bow hunter, the game changer is what makes September so much fun. Something that every one of you have the ability to learn. To be able to speak the language, knowing how to call elk into bow range. Oh, whoo, man, it gives me chills just thinking about it. And here's the greatest part. You can do this, guys. We know you can. But is elk calling a science or an art? Well, y'all, that might depend on who you talk to. But for us here at Elk Bros, we say it may be a little bit of both. But for those of you that want to be an artist, here's what you need to learn. First, you have to know what makes up your palette. And then this is where the art comes in. You have to know how to paint the picture. That discussion along with our Elk Bros shout outs and questions from our Elk Bros mailbox. So my friends, pull up a chair, adjust your volumes just right, and welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting, brought to you by ElkBros.com, with your host, Gilbert Ornelas, and elk hunting coach, Joe Gillian. You want to hunt elk? And they live to hunt elk. Their goal is to share with you what they have learned grinding it out for over 35 seasons, doing what they love. So come on into camp and set a spell. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunters. Hello there, everyone. If it's your first time with us, glad to have you. Hope you enjoy the show. And as always, for our Blue Collar Hunters following our show and grinding it out with us every week, welcome back to Elk Camp. I'm Gilbert Ornelas, the host of your show, coming to you from Spring, Texas, and from Katy, Texas. That's right, the leader of the Venezuelan Mafia, Luis Gonzalez, and from the DFW area, Manano Graterón, and from the Cimarron, New Mexico area. That's right, our elk coaches are in the house tonight, Leroy the Ninja Chavez. And w Joe Gillia. Joe Gillia is here. Joe, Joe Gillia is in the house. <laughs> and they are ready to give you some guys some really cool content tonight, Joe. <laughs> hey, hey, Beto, you gotta, you gotta do this intro again. I, I don't want to. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll feel really, really to, bad. To all the, to all the listeners out there, I just, I just want you all to understand that it's been really rough here in Texas. The weather has been extremely cold, right, Beto? And it's extreme deep freeze of 2021. Yeah, and then no electricity, no services. Um, you know, I, I'm telling you. My family slept bundled up by the fireplace for two nights in a row. And just so you can see the current situation that we're in right now, go to your YouTube channel and look at us right now. Manano was so cold, he went out to buy a jacket to kind of, you know, stay warm in this cold weather. And they were all out. So he had to go to the women's department. And that's the only place where he was able to find the jacket that he currently has. So, no, 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 uh, no, yeah, no, come no, check no. us out and you know, take a look at him. And, and yeah, I mean, no. understand how sorry you should be feeling for us. Luis, now. Luis, uh, Luis I'm, <laughs> I, I won't get distracted. I mean, Beto, you got to do this intro again. I don't, I don't want to be, I mean, I, 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 I'm the leader of the Venezuelan mafia <laughs> forever. Okay, I mean, I, I'm going to do, do the intro one time just for you, Manano. Here we go. <laughs> I'm Gilbert Ornelas, the host of your show, coming to you from Spring, Texas, and from Katy, Texas, in the Dallas metro area. The Venezuelan Mafia is in the house. My name is Cacharon and Luis Gonzalez, and from Cimarron, our elk hunting coaches are in the house. The elk ninja, Leroy Chavez, and your elk Don't hunting you. coach, Don't Joe you. Gillian, Don't is in the house. <laughs> see, see, now is we're talking. Guys? Is that better, guys? Yes. I mean, yes. It's, it's, now, now all we're talking. Wanted to hear one more intro, I know, because you guys can't yeah. get along. <laughs> wang, wang, cry, baby. <laughs> so, so we, we Might hear as well get y'all a bunch of suckers. That we want to hear your sob story about how was the family because of all the bad weather that just happened in Texas. What what was going on at your house? So. Um, it was, uh, I'm just, now you're making me think, man, what did I mispronounce? <laughs> no, you didn't You're trying to catch me with something that I probably mispronounced. I was like, man, he's going to get me somehow here. I mean, no, he, he just wanted, dude, that was really good what you did straight off the cuff on the first cut. 
Yeah. Yes. So, so tell no, me, what, what was it that, I mean, with the bad weather, how did you guys get over that? <laughs> so he's, uh, he's complaining. He's complaining because uh, his father-in-law and mother-in-law were there. Uh -huh. That's that's uh -huh. the main part of it, of his complaint. The outlaws. Oh, I don't complain about the in-laws, man. I love that's my in-laws. Now, so the the what happened was that because we didn't have any electricity, uh, we had Three, four, heat, eight. and uh -huh. uh, so we couldn't keep the house warm because the thermostats were 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 um, not functioning. Uh -huh. So uh, we had to just turn on the fireplace, and uh, uh, we all got bundled up and uh around the fireplace and that's where we slept for two nights you know what we call that here in new mexico what you call it see there that's bedtime bro that's yeah. bedtime. hey look I, I wouldn't wish this on anybody i mean you people that can endure six you know four to six months of this y'all are way better at this than i am i mean i've got a generator sitting inside my home right now because i don't want the dang snow and ice on it outside right now. we got power by the grace of god i hope it stays on uh, our water got turned back on yesterday yeah so i mean i hadn't had a shower in two or three days just some fit baths and stuff like that you know um so what kind of bath? Yeah, everybody's i mean i got cords running everywhere my house looks like a train wreck but uh look we we learned i mean we ate elk steaks every night and there elk you go and, I mean, we weren't hurting for anything. Yeah, country boy can't survive. Heck, I mean, yeah. we had some Weller on tap and little Frangelica. <laughs> and and uh, we, we weren't going to go thirsty. We weren't going to go hungry. And we right. weren't going to be cold because I had, you know, I had some heaters that could, you know. Yeah, I used some of those as well. Yeah, we spaced off a couple of rooms with some blankets. Mama knew what to do. And yep. and we put the heater on. Everybody, get, you know, uh, bundled up. Lacey's in college up there. You talk about snow, brother. Southern Arkansas has gotten it. I'm talking feet. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. So Lacey's up there in college and snows up to her hind, hind quarters. And I mean, you know, so she's doing good. And Logan and, and mama and everybody, we uh, we just cuddled up in one room and shoot, man. We yeah, man. The, the thing is, that. look, I, if we, the state wasn't prepared for it, man. This We hadn't no, had this right. low right. temperatures in about 120 years. That yeah, was the last time that... I, I heard it was 30, bro, but... Yeah, oh, 1983, we had some... 1895 but, is what I heard, but anyway. Yeah. It's it's old, but exaggerated. We have not had a week full of those temperatures. I mean, tonight I, won't be yeah, in that the was, news again. You know, yeah. one day, two days, but about day four, man. Yeah, yeah. Was, yeah. it gets old. Y'all's electric grid was Venezuelan born, and it went like, "No, we ain't doing this." Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, "Well, wait a minute, man. I left Venezuela a long time ago, precisely because oh, yeah. of all of this crap. And now <laughs> and we don't I'm have having to live We here. don't have brownouts down here, and we don't have power outages. I mean, yeah. we just don't. And yeah. they were just so ill prepared. Yeah. Um, I, there's a bunch of people are getting fired over this deal, man. Well, and, and, and look, man, it, it's it's. Uh, I, you know, lots of prayers for the for the people out there that suffer through all of this. And, and yeah. you know, some people didn't make it. I feel for the homeless and for the people out on the streets that didn't have, you know, any any means to uh, um, just, you know, withstand wife. these temperatures. Loretta you know, what was so open. bad is the oh. downtown skyline was lit up like Fourth of July oh. and nobody else had any power. Oh, wow. Oh yeah, people well, they had are really bad. That's why, right? Mm. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of them that had power down there. Never oh. lost power, you know. Mm. So this has been a it's been a train wreck of biblical proportions down here. Um, I, I am working with some insurance adjusters and stuff like that. This is the worst disaster Texas has seen in the last. And it, this is going to even over the hurricanes, bro. Absolutely, because really? it's going to affect every major city uh -huh. in Texas. Yeah. Right. Dallas, Fort Worth, Amarillo, San Antonio, Austin, and Houston. When you get a hurricane, it's usually Galveston and the coastal lying areas, right? right. right? Yeah. This has got all of Texas. I mean, my, our ranch in West Texas, there on the on the Pierce Ranch, it has been iced and snowed in for a solid week. Yeah. Wow. No, they can't even bust ice to get their livestock fed, Joe. So know? to segue this a little bit, I figured out why we got snowed on during September, man. It was y'all. Yeah, yeah. We brought the polar <laughs> vortex with us. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you come come to New Mexico in September and we get 
freezing daggum temperatures for three days. <laughs> you go back home to Texas and you almost kill the state over there. In February. Yeah. 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 <laughs> which which yeah, already, I mean, you know, normally by this time of the year, if things are already warming up, man. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah I was fishing in shorts and a t-shirt two weeks ago. That's crazy, man. So uh, as we start to move forward, I wanted to give a special note for you guys uh, about tonight's show is that, man, we are really excited about this show tonight because we're actually, we've talked a little bit about something like this, but we're excited the way we're going to bring this to you because I really believe that this is something that's special that a lot of people don't think about. It's just a little bit different. And we're not exactly sure how tonight's topic, how long it'll be, how long it'll take, how you know much we get into it. So if we need to make two episodes out of this, guys, we're going to go ahead and do that. All right. Because as we're going through this, you know, all you guys have the different levels from Chab to Luis to Gilbert to Manano, who, you know, is just like barely scratching the the calling surface. I think he's he's still using his mouth for his cow calls. How does that yeah. go? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and he wants to be perfect. called the leader of the Venezuelan mafia. Actually, oh. actually, I stopped the bull. I mean, Luis is going to start laughing. You're That's the, the truth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, st he I stopped you. that freaking bull. So we have people of all it. different I levels and call. abilities here. We have people that are still living in imagination and all kinds of things going on. <laughs> Joe, come on. The Disneyland of, of help calling here. <laughs> Uh, uh, come on joe all right joe we got to start this over now bro we got to start it over <laughs> please start the intro over joe yeah yeah oh bro oh, until i start man. hearing a sound come out of that diaphragm call man we're getting too close man we got like how many months we got now till we're back huh yeah right? dude uh, i'm ready huh that's seven six months six yeah, months it's, it's it's coming quick man half a year has gone by already yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, get this. Yeah. Um, by the time this comes out, it, right? Today's the. It, is today the 18th, February 18th? Yes, sir. So yeah. we're looking at. Um, so when this comes out next week, it's going to be kind of like about the 22nd. So uh, March 17th is the deadline for New Mexico. So applications are happening. We just had a insights edition hit where I interviewed, um, conservation officer, Jared Burns down in Southern New Mexico and did a special piece on, on drawing. Okay. On New Mexico tags and some things that you guys ought to think about in doing that. So check that out. All right. Well, Joe, you guys know shout what time out. it is. Shout out. Bro, shout, bro, shout, shout out. Shout out. New to the show, this is just shout outs to a few cities with the most listeners topping our charts this week, Joe. Yep. And a shout out to some of those grinders giving us such incredible reviews on Apple Podcasts. Wyoming Elk Hunter Jim. Oh, Gilbert, he said to tell you. <laughs> that your level bro that your bubbles in the middle <laughs> i don't know <laughs> yeah. and, and he said round is definitely a shape and then we had jay hillberry from southwest pennsylvania so those guys man they gave a couple you know uh wyoming jim he 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 was really he was really giving you some kudos bro his bubbles in the middle i like, I like, I like that that's, that's pretty cool, cool. no <laughs> doubt <laughs> um awesome. appreciate that mr hillberry yeah, we're three weeks in announcing this and we've yet to get one since uh, a couple of weeks, man. So remember, guys, if you want to be a part of our special video shout outs, just get your cell phone, take a 10 to 15 second video of yourself in landscape view. And then you can tell us your name, where you're from, uh, include a home of whatever or a special something special about your hometown, man. And then send the video through a message on our Elk Bros Instagram or email me, joe at elkbros.com, that you have a clip. I'll make sure you get a link to be able to sell, send it to me. Come on, y'all. We've. <laughs> what do we say now? Show your face. Celebrate, celebrate play. your place. There we go, right. man. <laughs> well, Joe, our top listening location this week is a neighborhood on the east side of Cleveland, Ohio. During Prohibition, it was known as Little Hollywood. From the large number of brothels and speakeasies located there, known for the Major League Ballpark that was built in 1910 
and it is the original home of the Cleveland Indian professional baseball team in none other than Huff, Ohio. Oh, yeah. 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 I'm glad I didn't have that one, man. I'd have been, it, it'd I don't been, know. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't have ever known how to pronounce that. Y'all never heard the one. Huff riots? I mean, back in y'all didn't study that uh, in history. I, I, I was like, I was like, it looks like Hugh. I oh, would have, Huff. I would have spelled that J O F if I would yeah. have heard. Or Huff. Yeah, the, Huff or, the Huff riots yeah. back in the '60s, man. They had some big riots going on up in Cleveland, but it's a little suburb there out of Cleveland. I'll be done. Ohio in the house. Ohio. Ohio. There we go. Yes, sir. Next up, located in the Red Cedar Valley in Wisconsin, at one time this next stop listening city's location was heavily populated by the Sioux. French fur traders first set up a trading post in the area. The name, however, was derived from the Algonquin meaning people of the rice. I was no it was known for this lumbering industry and was the location of the largest lumber industry in the world in the 1800s. Menominee, Wisconsin. Hey. Got it, dude. Nailed that. Ah, man, man, I smoked practice. that, I practiced on that one a little bit. I, Menominee, that's I, it, yeah. bro. I, uh, I, yeah, I'm with you, man. I was like, whatever he comes out with, I'm like, that's why you say it. <laughs> hey, he represented the Cheesehead State well with that. Menominee. There you go, man. Great job, Luis. working hard here over Bro, here. Bro, you were looking these words up since five o'clock this afternoon. <laughs> well, but I, I, you know, I don't have to tell people that though. That, that, that sounds good. I know, I do that all yeah. the time. I told yeah, them I got to go. get up early so you can That's make people. Next, <laughs> our next top <laughs> listening city sits on the Susquehanna River and is the state capital of Pennsylvania, home to the National Civil War Museum. The local cuisine is aptly represented by Progress Grill crab cakes and duke's crab pretzels and they got some crab in this place if you have a sweet tooth or love chocolate or if your wife loves chocolate east of town is hershey park a chocolate themed park offering rides and entertainment and of course chocolate oh i got to go harrisburg (laughs) pennsylvania harrisburg hburg pennsylvania so i always heard of harrisburg um, because that used to be where the big shows were for outdoor shows where people mm-hmm. would go to, to find hunts and uh-huh. uh, learn about so many different places. I always heard about people going to Harrisburg and in that Pennsylvania area. So, and man, Pennsylvania, they're rocking it with the elk herd too. Big time, man. They're yep. killing some large bulls up there, Joe. Yep. Hard to get a tag, but they say when you get one, it's on like Donkey Kong. This top listening city is known for its ski r- resorts and beaches like El Dorado Beach. It is a California resort city on Lake Tahoe in the Sierra Nevada mountains and once known as the sky capital as the ski, sorry, ski capital of the United States. The city restaurants and bars merge with the casinos of neighboring state line Nevada. The area was once inhabited by the Wabash, Wabash tribe, South Lake Tahoe, California. South, South Tahoe. Lake Tahoe, California. <laughs> Man, I'm going to tell you what, it's one of the most beautiful places I've ever vacationed in my life. Yeah. You Lake really Tahoe. right there on the state line of uh-huh. yeah. Nevada and Lake Tahoe on one of those mountains I stayed in Harris there. Uh, and let me tell you something, that's the first place I ever figured out that Altitude was a real thing, Joe, before I ever come out. I was probably 35 years old, me and my wife. We were going for our anniversary and everything. I forget which one it was. It was a long time ago. But we got there, and I'm telling you, both of us decided we were going to go on a little hike. Hell, brother, we didn't get halfway out the hotel. We had to turn around and come back. We, I said, man, I, I had an asthma attack or something like that. <laughs> oh, Lisbon. Oh, I'm like, oh, Lord have mercy. I, so Kelly was like, I don't know what, what's wrong with us here. And then we got to thinking, well, heck, man, it's like six, 7,000 feet up there, you know. And uh, then when we hiked all the way up to where that Emerald Lake Pass is, whoo, it's a way, way under up there. And 
we like to die, man. We had to stay in bed for two days. Joe, that altitude got mm-hmm. us, man. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm not going to go any further with that. I'm, I'm, just, uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to give you a little bit, Joe. But oh, dude, I was, I was <laughs> right, be like, yeah, blame it on the altitude. <laughs> <laughs> Chad, you're up, brother. Okay. Uh, oh, if, before, before Chad, before you start, man, the favorite thing when we went up to Tahoe up there, d- dude, did you go to the Bonanza set where they filmed Bonanza? Absolutely, yes, sir. Yeah, that's yes, what sir. I'm talking about. Bonanza. Bonanza. Uh, right. Okay. If you are a Vietnam veteran and own a mo- motorcycle, there's a good chance you have been to today's last top listening city. It's a suburb of St. Louis, Missouri, and the state's fastest growing city. It is host to the St. Charles County Fair and the St. Louis Renaissance Festival, and is the location of the first Vietnam Veterans Memorial in the United States. A regular stop in the National Run for the Wall trip for Vietnam veterans. And that's in uh, Wentzville, Mississippi. Wentzville, Mississippi. I, I, I Wentzville to Mississippi. <laughs> you know. Wentzville, Mississippi, the 601 show. Uh, yeah, I tried, dude. Yeah. Man. You know, dad joke. But, yeah. but that run <laughs> for the wall. <laughs> <laughs> I went to Ville, Mississippi. <laughs> but that run for the wall comes through Cimarron, too. Really? Yep. Mm-hmm. Awesome. In fact, they, yeah. would, they would come and the whole town, get this. The town would put on a spaghetti dinner for those guys to stop here and have a place to eat, feed all the guys that came through and uh, on their way coming through. It, it was a pretty big deal. Where'd they do it? At the hotel, Joe? Oh, no. Right here, right in the middle of town, man. I oh, mean, cool. Yeah. So it was uh, a, a pretty big deal uh, having that run for the wall come through here. Pretty awesome. awesome. So... Guys, tonight's topic, we're getting to it fairly quick here, man. So it's part seven, y'all, of the Elk Rose Preseason Guide Series. And this one, learn to paint with your elk calling. And the goal of the series is to give you our tips. Again, let me remind y'all, this is our perspective. This is how we do it. We don't say that we know it all. This is just how we do it. A lot of people are very successful doing a lot of other things. We're giving you how we roll. Okay, so we're going to try to get things rolling in the right direction for you and then help you develop that plan, the what, when, where, why, and how to hunt elk this year. And hopefully from the first six up to this one, you guys have already been developing your plan because everything that we've done along this way has been something to help you prepare this preseason. And, you know, guys, it's funny, and I haven't looked today, but... There was something that I just had to say something about because when I looked at the series and I can actually see how much each, you know, of our podcasts are listened to, right? And to me, there was something that was really evident on where we have our chinks in our armor because everybody was listening to like the physical part of it, right? And they were looking to all those other steps that we had. But when we got to the mental mindset, it was like, I I don't need that. You know, I'm good. But the thing I want to tell you, man, is I, I hope you are good. And I hope you don't need to hear those messages. But for me, As a person in my life, that's why I surround myself with these guys so that I hear those kinds of messages all the time, especially when I start to slip. And I think that that's real evident of where we are and why there's a 90% and a 10% because there's, you know, 90% that we're trying to do all this other stuff, but we ain't getting it straight upstairs, man. And If you don't have, and like Luis said, it's that mindset that you have to have is in so many different areas. It's not like just telling you, you got to be mentally tough. No, that's not what we're telling you, man. It's, it's to get that confidence and to develop that mindset and develop that attitude, that winning attitude in all of those areas. So um, if you haven't listened to that, that's fine. 
Uh, but I encourage you anytime you can to think about how you can make your mental endurance stronger to find a way. So I just wanted to get that out there. Okay. Yeah, for sure, Joe. And I think, you know, positive reinforcement is always good. Uh, I think that's something that, you know, we, as coaches, that's what we strive to do with our athletes and with the people that we coach or mentors be positive, you know, definitely got to be real and, and no, you know, fish in the right ponds, as we would say. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, uh, be real about your talent level and what you need to work on and, uh, and have constructive criticism, but be positive in those, in those things. And your mental focus is everything, man. Yeah. I and mean, you, you know what? You don't have that. You're going to you know struggle. After your guys have practiced all week doing all that stuff. And yeah. then they go out there and it's just not, the head's just not in it. What's the first thing that you tell somebody is get your head right. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, we had, we've had to pull athletes off the field and go, hey, look, you got to reset. You know, this is no knock on you. You just, your head's not in the right place. And 90% of them will tell you, look, you know, uh, practice was great, everything, but I had something that was on my mind or on my heart and it just, it wasn't right, you know. And, so and once I got it right, things changed for them. Well, one of the things that, uh, that Gilbert always says, you know, at the end of the day, and yeah, right. every hunter – is really going to live through that and understand it and learn from it and, you know, be in, in that situation. But really at the end of the day, all we're trying to do is kind of give, give people a heads up as like, Hey, this is real, this happens. And if you can prevent it, this is potentially how we have prevented it for ourselves or we have improved it for ourselves and just, you know, hoping to help people as they go through that process, because Absolutely. you will go through that process as a whole. Oh, man, man yeah, the ups and downs, the ebbs and flows. You know, I was so fortunate to be able to do a little insight series with Guy, um, you know, in, in on the Western Contours. Awesome. Do what? It was awesome. Yeah. yeah. I, and, and for me, that was the number one thing. He, you know, he asked me how, what do you lean on when you're struggling? You know, and for me, it was all about the mental makeup. You know, uh, I had a whole bunch of things that was in my, if, if you guys get a chance to go to Western countries and listen to that, I, you know, if you struggle at all with anything in your life, I think it'll help you. Uh, I'm not going to give it away. You're going to have to go listen to it. But mm. uh, the people that have listened to it, <laughs> I've had a whole lot of feedback on it already. Ready. And, you know, what I will say is the, the first part of it, when you get into it, you're not going to like it a lot, but it's a, it's a gut check thing. And uh, at the end of the day, you know, you're going to, you're going to like where it takes you. If you can, if you can be real with yourself, if you can't, you know, um, Luis is right. You're going to live through all these ups and downs and wonder, wonder why. Well, I can tell you why it's because we're not mentally prepared for what's ahead of us. Absolutely, man. And I, 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 again, we always preach how that part of it is so important, not just in the elk hunting, it's important in all aspects of your life. Correct? It's what makes our group the strongest group out there. I'll take all five of these guys, myself included, and Brendan, I'll take these guys and fight hell with a water pistol every day because these guys know how to win. They know how to win. They've been through the fire. They, they've been battle tested. Um, at the, at the end of the day, that's who I want with me. Like I said, when you go back to back and fight hell with a water pistol with these guys, enough said, what else we got to say? You know, mm -hmm. that's who I'm riding with, you know, you Likewise. And, uh, so, I, so diving into this, man, you know, Joe's going to help us paint this picture that's coming up, uh, well, and, and, and change the game for yourself as an elk hunter. Sure. Absolutely, man. And one thing that I wanted to, uh, to tell everybody is this is part seven. Next week is part eight. That's elk scouting focus goals and realities. And then y'all, I'm announcing it now so y'all can start getting ready. Part nine is a look at the gear and the setups of the elk bros crew, how we roll. So I want you to think about the, those things. And, and, you know, everybody's always asking about our bow setups. They're always asking about what we have in our pack, what we carry with us, how we do that, you know. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about that, the things that, that we have. Because I know some of y'all uh, have gone through a lot of evolution in that. You know, I know, mm -hmm. I know Luis's pack goes through an evolution from the beginning of the hunt to the end of the hunt, right? Yeah, every year. <laughs> every year, dude. Yeah. He comes over to my tent. Hey, man, do you take this with you? No. 
<laughs> this thing's heavy, dude. I'm telling you. I told you. Hey, and the day I decide to leave something behind, my nan was asking for it in the middle yeah. of the night. <laughs> <laughs> that thing was not up one time, dude. And I was like, bro, you packed out a quarter already or what? You yeah, know? Man, <laughs> hey, man. Hey, you know what? has got to carry the stuff. Yeah, and you said next week, Joe, but I guess the next week – as far as part eight part being eight, next right. week, it, it depends on, on whether, whether we this stretch this in into two today, episodes yeah. because yeah. of its length, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and yeah. look, I, I, for me, Joe, I, I, we can't spend enough time on this subject. Oh, this then, is a game changer for absolutely. everyone. A lot of con- yeah. There's a lot of content. And before we jump into it, I'm gonna I'm just gonna take this second and say, guys, we would appreciate it if our grinders, if y'all just took a second to subscribe and rate the show. Let us know what you think and help us to know if what we're doing has value to y'all out there. I just wanted to take that quick time just to ask you guys to do that. And with that said, it's part seven, learning to paint with your elk calling. <laughs> y'all, hmm. uh, this is what I live for, man. Right man Manano, Manano went and actually got a a bucket of paint and he's been using the call and dipping it on it and and so it's like no manano that's not, not what a bad idea means. though that's not what joe it's means not a manano. bad idea to use it as a chip <laughs> so guys if we were to ask any september bow hunter if i was to ask y'all or any rifle hunter that hunts around the end of the rut what is the coolest part of elk hunting what do you think they'd say it's gotta be the elk bugle yeah, early, hands down, early in the, the screaming, morning. dreaming on the screaming. Dreaming on the screaming, right? <laughs> <laughs> to our grinders out there, look, we want you to really hear this and we want to be totally clear. Being able to call elk is an absolute, the absolute game changer. Because here's what I feel about it, man. Even if you don't know the area you're hunting, I don't care where you are or at the very least, you're still going to be in the ball game. If you Mm -hmm. just know how to call elk, if you have that down in in basic form to any advanced form, you can go anywhere. I I truly believe this. I don't care where you go. You have that calling skill set, and you can create opportunity. The one advantage is they all speak the same language. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Absolutely. And yeah, none regardless of which state they're from <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I think it's important to note too and this is a shout out to to paul snort i want every person out there listening to this to understand that you have absolutely have the ability to learn to call elk you can do this we know you can what we're going to do now is i'm going to give you a list of and all of us together of what we believe and we'll discuss this are some of the problems for most elk hunters when it comes to calling elk and then instead of just giving you the problem we're going to talk about a solution to that problem the painting's coming man but i want you to hear this section right here okay and and look let's be clear we're getting ready to list these problems but anybody that has these problems or limitations can and are still going to kill elk on occasion no doubt yeah because any call and any call is better than no call and can create opportunity especially if the right bull is in the right mood at the right time okay but our purpose with what we're teaching you is not about the occasional success Right, right. This so you can go anywhere, and you can. Yeah, be it's about being consistent. Yeah, and and understanding what you're doing. Sure. Yeah, consistent opportunities. That's the key, man. If you're, it's all about an opportunities game. Okay. All right. So first, the first problem that I see is that most elk hunters, especially new elk hunters, don't know where to start. So they go to the store and they purchase an elk call and they're going to purchase the easy one, the one that uh, they can use as soon as possible or, um, the cheapest. or one that somebody says is the best sounding. What's that, bro? 
or the cheapest the cheap hey look <laughs> yeah look at look at my hand it's yeah I, yeah i would have right you know if if it's if it's supposed to sound like an elk and it costs less i'll get it so the grunt tube that i use is a walmart grunt tube that i have been using that same style for as long as i can remember and we've been shoot until i don't know the last three years using the primos white or the primos black all that time and the yeah. because that's what was available at the store that we went to and he continues to use it because manano and i keep saving it <laughs> every, like, time, I don't every, know. every time he forgets it in the woods oh, he's lost five or six times <laughs> <laughs> I, I, i've lost a few <laughs> lost a couple Do not it. only have i lost a few I've had to use <laughs> somebody else's. <laughs> yep. Yeah. We we have a, we have a, a pretty. Oh, he has a pretty strong connection with me. I'm glad to say it's not the other way around. Dude, you know I, I'm heartbroken, man. But no, no, dude. If 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 you would have lent me a diaphragm call and I would have used it, you would have taken it back and continued to use it, huh? Well, he no. hesitated. Don't <laughs> <laughs> oh, be scared, buddy. Hold on. We're, we're going to re record that part. Manano. <laughs> no. yeah. Man Manano has just smelled you too much, man, to know that, you know, you need to kind of keep some separation there. <laughs> well, so, so there's something I want to say about that. You know, like I said, is, is that most guys are going to go and they're going to purchase the That's easiest right. one, right? And they're just looking for something. But I also <clears throat> want to say this, man. I don't care what kind of call it is, what kind of grunt tube it is, in the right hands, it's not going to matter, man. Absolutely. You yeah, know, yeah. I you agree. Put that in the right hands. I don't. I don't care what you give them. They're going to. Yeah, gonna... because I think there's there's two factors to that. One is, you know, whether or not you can make it sound right. And if it's a, if if it's one that you really don't control the sound, then the second factor kicks in is when to use it. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's yeah, it makes that's sense. the huge part right there, right? Knowing when to be able to use that call. So the solution for those people, mm -hmm. I think the solution is exactly what people are doing right now. Is there's so many more resources out there? And man, the the quality of calls and the number of calls. There's so many calls out there right now that you can purchase that are going to come out of the container and you're going to be able to make good noises with them where, you know, Gilbert, you and I have used the Primos black and the Primos white for years, but. Oh yeah. It, but Still it's do. critical that you know how to tune those. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I mean, look, I hadn't, I hadn't touched it in a while and I pulled it out of the package and hoo -hoo, buddy, it's mm -hmm. ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> you so, know, and then I, I took a brand new one out and, blew it a couple times and it's, it's rock steady. So the second problem that we see guys is that, that people's calling and their closing ability is limited through limited equipment. They become a one trick pony. In other words, they have an external bugle that might be great at bugling, but that's all they have. Okay. So once they get in close, they're, they're pretty much stuck. You're not really going to take that external bugle. And once that bull is within sight or is coming in that closing distance, there's not much that you're going to be able to do with that. Yeah, yes. no. And, and I follow you. One, one of the things that uh, this kind of makes me think about is, you know, the beauty of being able to, and we've talked about this before, the beauty of being able to per, per escalate, start as a lover, and then escalate as the situation demands. Correct. And, and to do that, you need all the the, the the tools in the toolbox mm -hmm. to kind of get to that point. Right. If you only know how to bugle, you're already starting at that end, and you know your picture may be completely trashed, and you and, yeah, and may actually is, blow up an opportunity instead of absolutely. making it. Absolutely. And what I'm saying is it's not only that all they do is know how to bugle, it's that they have a device that that's all it does is bugle. Right, right, right. Get excellent point. Yes, sir. Yeah. So it's an external call. And a lot of people end up buying those external bugles that have the read on it, and 
they're great for locating and there's a lot of things you can do with those as far as bringing that bull in but there's going to be a point where your game is over you're stuck okay mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and so then we have the other thing you know we have people that uh <laughs> get the cow calls they don't want a bugle so they get an external cow call and because they've heard that it brings them in every time that and Man, those cow calls are incredible at producing some great cow sounds. You know, what people mm -hmm. determined estrus or estrus yeah. buzz or, you know, things like that. But if that's all they have, then that's all they have, right? That's their only tool. And there's a point with that as well, because I don't know if you've ever used one of those externals or heard them, but they are loud, man. I mean, they're... <laughs> Oh yeah. Yeah. You can't quiet them down. You know, yeah. uh, I mean, it's just, it's like in your face. I mean, oh, and then, and then it makes it easier on them to pinpoint you. Yeah, yep, absolutely. You can't play, you can't play with depths yeah. and, and, and yeah. So yeah. what I love about the bugle tube and then a diaphragm call is I can put the bugle tube around my neck here and through, through here and pull it, pull it back around me, Joe, and you have it available to you to throw your call behind you, you know, or you can softly cow call with it. I mean, you can really do some things. When I killed my bull this year, I shoved my, my bugle tube to the side. I drew my bow, was able to do everything and stop the bull with my, with my diaphragm call. It was in my right. mouth. If you all watch the video, you can see I got the, I'm talking like a goober because I got this thing in my mouth, but I always <laughs> have it in there. You know? <laughs> Not just because I talk like a goober, but at the end of the day. Now, I'll tell you, there <laughs> are a lot of hunters out there. There's a lot of guides out there. There's a lot of people that they use an external bugle and they combine it with external cow calls. And mm -hmm. they make a great living and have a lot of success doing oh, yes. that. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. But you got to remember what that situation is. That's a partner situation yeah. with someone sure. back behind. Yeah. He's not him. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. But for that solo hunter, solo. Mm -hmm. yeah, man, that, that's mm -hmm. a, that's a, it, it just creates such a limiting and it makes it so difficult to close when those critters come on in. Right. right. So that's one thing is that. Yeah. And I, you know, and I, I like the external call. Yeah. I like the external call if I'm not the one hunting because mm -hmm. then I got to hold it and blow up all that other stuff. And I don't want to do that. You know, I need to have my, I need to have my bow in my hand and ready to draw back in any second. Yeah, absolutely. But if I'm calling, I'm guiding. Yeah, I have one of them hyper calls or making the bull crazy or, you know, even that little bone collector call that you bite down on. That thing's awesome. It makes some great sounds. Yeah, well, Rocky Mountain Elk Calls has just come out with a, a great external that um, uses a little pressure tab with the mouth. It does a great job, man. It, I mean, it's one of the more realistic that you'll hear out there. And there's yeah. some of them. Well, the only thing I, the problem that I see with a lot of those is, and it's just like even when people purchase a diaphragm call, because that's what we were going to say is number three. And number three was that they purchase a diaphragm call and they don't really practice until two weeks before or on the ride out to their elk hunt. I mean, they're just like in their vehicle practicing the whole time as they're heading to an elk hunt. And this happens a lot with those externals too. They've blown through it and they're like, Oh, okay. I got that. And so when they go out there, they sound the same every, every time. time, sound the same yeah. every time. And so there's no vi variety. There's no depth. And when we start talking about painting a picture here, you know, it, it's real hard to paint a picture when you're not able to control your strokes. Okay. Mm -hmm. when you're not able right. to control your pressure when you're not able to uh, control how soft or how much you lay that paint on, right? So mm -hmm. that's where the artistry comes in. Uh, problem number four that I see with most people when they're calling elk is that everyone wants to directly engage a bull. They're going to locate bugle, locate bugle. If they get a response, they're going to challenge. They're going to locate bugle, locate bugle. If they get a response, they're going to challenge okay and there's there's only one person a very low percentage of situations in which that will be effective and that will be when that other bull just happens to be in the mood of simply you know challenging back yeah Fighting. yeah 
Yeah. That's and yeah, that's your early season usually is, rare. Usually run him off. Yeah, depending on what time of the year you're on. Yes, yeah, sir. You, yes. you know, uh, with you. What's that, Chef? The percentages aren't with you. It can happen, right. but it usually won't. Yeah, especially right. depending on what time of year you're out there. Yeah, I mean, we're we're early season. We're locating him. We're cutting the distance, you know, and then we're going to sound like a lover the whole time. You know, we're going to get those cow calls mewing, and if he, if he keeps talking, we're going to keep cutting the distance and keep giving him what he wants. If he shuts up, then, you know, then you got to – you got to try to paint a different picture, you know? Yeah. So how many times, Joe, have you they did a location bugle and then cut the distance and then he bugled again and then you cut him off and challenge him and then he just shuts up all the time. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. He ain't got nothing to say no more. Yep. You know, either, either he was with cows and took them on with him or he got scared and run the heck off. Yeah, he's like, that you dude know, is too bad. big. I don't want to mess yeah. with him. Yeah, big you bad imagine? Luis is coming through the woods. Yeah, yeah, could you right. imagine Manano are walking through the woods and I'm going, hey, anybody else out there? Hey, anybody else out there? Manano's like, hey, I'm over here. And I said, who the hell are you? You know, I mean, yeah. back up. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> all over like, you. You know? That's not very, that's not very uh, elk-like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the thing is, is for us, that challenge bugle is such a small part of our tool set. Right. Well, and it's predicated on if he's challenging you, you know, right. you can hear him cutting the distance for sure and challenging you, you know, on that location. Bugle. I mean, he will start screaming his head off as he's, and you can tell he's coming too, you know? So, but I, usually though, when that happens, you just give him a little couple of little cow calls and you get ready because it's, it's, he's going to be in your lap. And if he has escalated to that point, now yeah. it's different. Now yeah. you can smack him in the face, man. You bet. But, you, you don't want to get a bull to go, hey, I'm over here. And then you're like smacking them in the face right away. Right, right. And, yeah, and even uh, better in that scenario, we rake a little tree, make other, you know, make that bull sound. He, now he's real curious about what bull's around, you know. Well, and the, the additional point to all that is, is that's talking about when you're engaging. And yep. most of the time, a lot of our calling is non-engaging, which we're going to talk about here for sure. in a few minutes. But – now, that challenge bugle that everybody's talking about, when you are not engaging a target bull and you're doing a scenario when you're painting a picture, now that challenge bugle gets to get used within that scenario if you know what you're mm-hmm. doing, but it has nothing to do yeah. with the target bull, and we'll explain right. that. Yeah, if you're putting on a show. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Sounding like a big herd. So another problem that um, – that I see as common problem with hunters is that they're not able to read a bull's response or they don't understand the when, why, or how to respond to situation. That's what you were talking about, Luis, earlier. Yeah. I mean, guys get to the base camp. I mean, it's phenomenal for that. Right. And I was listening to, um, Rowe resources. Oh yeah. Uh, Chris, Chris Rose. Rose. Yeah. And, um, he, he made He made a really good example. Once if we go to the grocery store uh-huh. and then, you know, you stand up in the middle of the produce section and then you start screaming, screwdrivers, uh, lanterns, gas pumps, tires, you know, all for sale. People are going to be like, what the heck are you talking about? Right. I mean, so, but Probably now tomatoes and bananas. And all that yeah. Is. But if now if you actually go to the produce store, you stand in the middle there and it's like, Hey, everybody listen up. We got, you know, tomatoes in this aisle for this much. They, you know, you're, you're making sense with the environment, right, right? you know, but the moment that you start just shouting out words that may not mean anything in the environment, mm-hmm. you know, people are going to be, are you going to get close to that guy to try to listen to the information that he's giving when he's shouting out crazy, crazy names and, you know, crazy offers, or are you actually, once the guy starts talking about the produce, then you're going to get close to kind of understand, Oh, what, what kind of deals do we have around here? Now you're going to be curious. Yeah. I may have not given it the best example and may not be sound oh, as eloquent no. and Mr. As Mr. Uh, Rowe. Uh, Chris Rowe, but that's, that was, I, I believe what was his point is yeah. uh, you have to, you have to understand the situation in order for you to know when and how to use that call. Right. No, you're absolutely right. That's, that's, that's huge. And 
Um, one thing that we haven't done is we haven't given a solution for all these yet. And for this one that you're talking about, Luis, there's plenty of ways that you can learn about the when, the why, and the how. Like you mentioned one already, Chris Rowe Resources is phenomenal. Um, uh, Paul Medell, the Elk Nut, his app mm -hmm. is phenomenal. Uh, you can go to our uh, Blue Collar Elk Academy. We teach you that stuff as well. It's um, awesome. Yeah. Uh, you you got, can't miss. You follow those scenarios, you will kill a bull every time. You have the Elk Calling Academy. You've got Elk 101. There are mm -hmm. resources out there. So there's your solution is do your homework. And if I, if I back up to those other ones where, like we said, the problem was being a one-trick pony with, a, with equipment, we talked about external calls. Well, if you're not going to go to a diaphragm call and you're going to use external calls, then have multiples and make sure you're in a partner setup so that you can use those externals so that they can give, you can give different sounds at different levels and, and paint that picture a little bit better. And as far as purchasing a diaphragm or, or even an external and not getting the practice in, well, you guys, it's just putting in the work. I mean, that's the solution. You got to put in the work, right? Um, and as far as the problem of engaging a bull directly with, a, with challenging all the time is to understand that that is not your only tool in the toolbox, which we're going to talk about here in a few minutes. So we're going to try to help you with that answer huge here in a minute. And mm -hmm. I think the last problem that I see with hunters when they're calling elk is they don't know when to move or develop the situation while calling they they like if they get a response it's like okay mm. that bull is a half mile away she knows she my name me. now what <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so yeah. i'm i'm gonna sit right here and call that bull all the way in right or <laughs> You know, they have a situation where that bull's actually starting to move off to a different direction and you just stay put. I mean, there's times um, that you got to make moves and you got to make aggressive moves, you know, uh, whether you're the shooter or whether you're the caller sometimes. And Manano this year was a great example of that, you know, uh, yeah. the move that he made on his bull when we were back there calling. Uh, a super example. So I think that is a big problem of, feeling like once they've got a response that they got to stay put. And, and here's the thing I want to tell you is that elk are always moving. Now a bull, a bull can sit in one place. He can be in his bed and he can advertise. And, and you know, because it's the middle of the day and it's just coming from one place. Yeah, that, that happens. But most of the time when elk are talking, they're moving. They might yeah. talk here and they're going to be in another position or their head's going to be turned another way. Uh, it, it's just, that's the reality of it. So don't get locked in when it seems like you need to act. Uh, so easy to get hung up, Joe. So easy. Uh, oh, absolutely. And, and especially when you're not experienced to get understanding the language, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. For, it, it's pretty simple though guys when you break it all down you, if you can get one to answer you and, and we we you know we'll do this in yard increments you know we'll put four or five hundred you know or, you know and if it's further than that we'll go half mile you know whatever it is but you know when you got a bull that's 500 yards from you or more you there's one thing you gotta do you gotta cut yeah. the distance absolutely yeah. you know yeah. you get a response you got to get on your horse, cut that distance in half, you know, yeah. and maybe slow cow calling another time. Boom, got another response. Keep rolling, man, yeah. till you and, get within that 100 yards. And then, you know, it, then it's time to settle down and work. And, and one of the biggest insecurities that a new caller may face, and, and I speak, you know, out of my own experience, is that, you know, when you're out there and you, you get a response, I mean, how do I respond now? What picture do I paint? Now, all these questions are going through your head, and it's like, well, am I going to am I gonna respond the right way? Am I going to sound right when I actually, you know, throw that call out? You know, what do I do? <laughs> so, you know, and, and we've talked about this in previous podcasts as well, Joe, but, you know, like if you're panicking and you're freaking out and you don't want to mess it up, the safest bet is just mimic. Yep, absolutely. Just, just mimic what the bull is doing and then just get to – you know, try to get through that situation. If, if you, if you, 
if you seal the deal, great. And then reflect back and, you know, what, what, what was happening and what could have you done differently? Right. So Chad, let me ask you a question. How do you, how do you know, how do you gauge what, I'm going to put you on the spot here. What things happen or what things do you hear or see that make you recognize that a bull is, is either in that zone where, man, you better be getting ready or tells you, you got to make a move. Grinders tuning in. Thank you for listening to the Blue Collar Elk Hunting Podcast. Our goal is to share our knowledge and help you flatten that learning curve so that you too can have some of the very same incredible experiences that have given all of us here at Elk Bros a lifetime of memories. If you like what you hear or see, you can get all of this information plus so much more from our Base Camp Elk Hunting Training Camp, the first in a series of online courses from our Blue Collar Elk Academy. Our Base Camp Training Camp allows me to use my coaching style and share almost 40 years of elk hunting experiences successfully hunting elk on public lands as well as over 20 years guiding hunters of all ages and experience levels. This course will be like nothing you have ever experienced in concept and structure using success-based coaching techniques that will elevate your confidence and skill sets. Our camp will prepare you specifically from that final moment most in your control, those final minutes or seconds the elk is in front of you, backwards through each step and level, allowing you to see, visualize, understand, and relate every coaching point to what lies ahead, the next step, the next thought process, the next success. Because y'all, you've already been there. You know what it looks like. By tapping my 30 years of teaching and coaching experience, our camps are developed considering multiple learning modes with text, visuals, audio, as well as video. And Base Camp will benefit those new to elk hunting all the way to the 10 to 15 year vet. So if you are looking for that one thing to help you fill that tag this year, invest in the most important piece of equipment there is, you and your elk hunting knowledge. You can find the Blue Collar Elk Hunting Academy and the Base Camp Training Camp at elkbros.com. That's E-L-K-B-R-O-S dot com. Keep dreaming of the screaming, believing in achieving, and most of all, keep grinding. Well, usually um, when you get to, when you start hearing the bugle kind of slowly moving away from you, you know that uh, you got to make a move and, and close the gap. And uh, at the same time, if you hear the bugle getting closer to you, uh, you know he's reacted to something that you've done. And that kind of reminds me of the time Gilbert and I climbed the mountain <laughs> that one time. You know, we, we heard <laughs> literally, a bugle. literally, yeah, we heard, climbed uh, the yeah, we heard a bugle a long ways off. And just headed in that direction, and uh, after about a half hour or so, uh, uh, Gilbert just bugled one time, and we heard the bugle, and it was getting a little bit closer. So uh, after that, we just started closing the gap, and you can you can hear call calls, and the, and then all we had to do do a few call calls, and the bugle kept getting closer and closer. So we knew we had to close that gap because we knew we had a, a, a bull in the string at that time. And little did we know that there was another herd that had heard coming from the bottom, coming from a different place that had heard both of us. So we had two bulls that were engaged and it started by us knowing that uh, we had to close that gap right off the bat. Um, but a lot of times uh, you just hear the bull slowly moving away and, uh, at that point, uh, he's not interested, but there's other techniques to use. And it's like uh, you're number five on the list. Uh, you know, being able to read a bull's response is really important. You know, otherwise you do get stuck like Luis said, what, what am I gonna do? Right. If you understand uh, the response of the bull, then you have uh, choices to make. Yeah, and I, to me, when a bull is on top of you, their voice sounds different. Oh, yeah, yeah you, must, must. you hear every guttural growl. You yeah, know. and you can hear the air. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, could, 
you can hear that air in their voice when they're right on top of you. And uh, and I tell you what, man, if you hear a bull, if you can hear a glunk, oh, he's close. They're in they're in your hip pocket, man. If yeah. you start mm-hmm. to hear that glunking, yeah, you know, yeah, that. you know, you know what I I always uh, do when I, I mean uh, how 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 to know if I have to move or not, I just measure by the Vito Lackis stuff. <laughs> if my Vito Lackis go off, like, okay, it's close. Stay, stay calm and just <laughs> stay here, Manano. Don't move. It's close. Use the Vito Lackis gauge. It, yeah, the Vito Lackis goes like, okay, I don't know, 50%. Yeah, we have 100 yards. We have to move. <laughs> yeah, I'll never forget the first bull that R.C. Knox ever called in for me that I shot. <laughs> I was sitting there on my knees and RC's, well, I, this bull is screaming from the top of his lungs up there on the top of the black timber. And uh, I'm just sitting there kind of, I don't, I don't even know if I, I had an arrow knocked up, I'm pretty sure. And then RC looks at me and he goes, are you ready? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. He goes, well, you better get ready. He's coming. And I'm like, man, he sounds like he's way up there, you know? And man, like that. I mean, that boy is down on us, walking in through the daggum Aspens, and, and RC is walking the other direction, calling, you know. Right. He, you better get ready because he's coming, you know. And he just gets up and he starts off. And I'm like, how in the hell did he know that oh. that bull was coming? Because I can't I got it. Like us. I didn't right. hear any difference in the bull screaming up here and him whining that call that he had. And he goes to walking away. And I mean, I didn't even more look around, and there he is head coming through the aspens never talking, never making a sound joe oh my Walks god out, saw yeah. that fire break and whoo, i mean just freaking blows one right in my face dude <laughs> i'm like oh my god. you know they're humongous critters Which everything pin? i learned about <laughs> bow hunting run out the crack of my hind end right there <laughs> right there <laughs> bull turns broadside at 19 yards and not the whole time when he walked out, this is hilarious. The whole time when that bull walks out in the fire break, I have ranged that where he's walking out 40 yards. I draw that bow back, and that 40-yard pin stays on that bull when he turns broadside at 19. <laughs> <laughs> I let it go, man. It knocked that bull clean off his feet and laid him over on his side with the big arrow sticking out <clears> just underneath uh, I shot him too close to the shoulder and right below the hump and got one long and they were able to find him about six weeks later, but yeah. man, I'm telling you, it was a giant bull, 340 something. I believe. Yeah, that was awesome. you, and you know, the thing was, I can remember, I think it was like the day before, cause you and I had just really starting to know each other. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and I was talking to you about that and I was saying, you know, and I was talking about shot location and this and that with you. And you were like, you were like, dude, I've killed hundreds of whitetail, man. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, you just hit that thing in front of me and it's over. <laughs> Never seen anything like that in my life. The, the pressure, uh, the pressure and the sheer um, aura that that animal has when he walks down and he's bugling his head off and he's urinating everywhere. It will definitely change. Like Manana says, your vitter like this goes through the roof, you know, yeah. and you really can't, you really can't mimic that when you're in your practice, you just no, got to get no around them. And, uh, you know, I try now to not let that affect me at all. Uh, whether they're looking at me or whether they're bugling or anything, uh, it's just something that you got to get around yeah. and kind of get used to. And some guys it may never bother, but I'm going to tell you right now, my first experience like that, and, and look, I, it, it wasn't just because of that. I mean, everything was so heightened because we had bulls all over us, bulls fighting, bulls going everywhere. I mean, we probably had 20 bulls in that set, and I could have killed seven or eight of them after I shot that bull. I mean, it was right, just yeah. – it was a, a unbelievable experience. That's how it always man. happens. Man. I yeah. get I get full force Vito Lacus with shakes and everything with hogs every month. Yeah. Imagine how I get with a freaking bull elk that I potentially get exposure to, you know, once a year. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, you know, <laughs> I, I harken back to what Chav was saying. Chav's so good at listening and reading the response of a bull. Uh, the morning I killed my big bull you know, you guys were pushing that herd from below. We had no yeah. idea. 
that y'all were pushing that herd. Yeah. And those bulls were all, I mean, there were a lot of bulls in that herd and a big herd of elk, a lot of cows too. And when, when Chav and I got in the middle of them, it was really about me just sounding like another cow that was lost. And those bulls just came in there single file, one after another, after another, after another. And then it was just about me stopping that bull to get a shot off. So, so I, I want, I hope everybody just listened to what just happened there and what Gilbert was saying. And uh, because that's going to come in here in a few minutes, because what he did was actually a little bit of scenario. He was not engaging any of those bulls. He was do. doing something that actually set a little bit scene, relaxed and let everything flow and let the game come to him actually mm -hmm. in that situation. So that was a great way of going into what we're going to be talking about here in a minute. Because listen, guys, when, when we're calling elk, most people don't realize this, but we're trying to do one of five of these actions. And some of these can actually change. When one happens, you can actually go to another action. We're either trying to locate, we're trying to participate, we're trying to irritate, we're trying to challenge, or we're excluding. Those are the things when we're calling that we're doing. You know, you're doing a location bugle. When we're doing participate, that's when we're just doing herd talk. That's like kind of what Gilbert was just saying, that he just wanted to sound like a couple of cows just to put it out there and say, hey, everything's good over here. It's hey, just, over here. Yeah. yeah. Hey, here we are. Just hey, boys. That herd mentality. <laughs> or we want to irritate. Just like that uh, satellite bull that's on the outside yeah, of that group, irritating that herd bull and has other satellites around there. Or we want to challenge when the situation calls for challenging, when it escalates. But listen, <laughs> yeah, the one that we think that is the most deadly of all those and that is the most underused is excluding. Oh, no, and, doubt. no yeah. doubt. And and I call excluding. Have you guys ever been snubbed? You know what it means to me? Yeah. Snubbed? No, I don't know what that means. It, what it means. <laughs> that's when when that's when Manano doesn't talk to you because he's angry with you, man. Oh yeah, I know what that means. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so it's like when you go up to a group group of people or or you go up to a person, and you're like, hey, how's it going? And they act like you're not even there. Yeah, they go, hmm. <laughs> okay. That's they they like That's snubbing. You know, they, yeah, they just kind of turn and they'll start talking to other people. That's when you snub somebody. It's you like know, down here in Texas, though, snub's got a different word too. <laughs> So hard, Joe, and <laughs> that's called snubbing, like that. <laughs> yeah, that's snubbing. So that that's a Texas word. Snubbing. Yeah. Okay. I, I, Makes I sense. Heard that one before. Yeah. So not sobbing. I I know I know do that all the time. And the <laughs> she snubs, she snubs. She snubs all the time when she cries. <laughs> that's man, babies do it a lot too. <laughs> My grandpa used to say, "All oh, that child snubbing, you hear him in there? Somebody go I'm, pick him up." Anana does it while snoring. <laughs> oh, so we're back talking, to the topic, boys. When we're talking about excluding, when we're talking about snubbing, that's when we are we're, we're snubbing our target bull, or um, we can do that when we know what our target bull is, or sometimes. Uh, even when we don't know that a target bull really exists, it, like if we're moving through transition areas or we've seen fresh sign or we've caught a whiff or we've heard a low audible noise or something that gives us an idea, we might go into a calling scenario that is not about trying to call that particular animal. We're excluding. We're basically, I compare it to like chumming the water. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. like throwing a lot Having out our there. own party. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And trying to attract something. Right. Yep. So this is where it comes in, man, that the, this is the secret to the elk bros right here, man. And I, I'm not able to tell you how many elk look, I hear people all the time that they say that, yeah, we were camped out and we we're camped out on the fence line and our hunting units on this side. Well, all the elk were over on that side. And 
So we couldn't go hunt them. Yeah, and I'm like, that is the perfect snubbing situation. No doubt. That is the perfect scenario situation. Because if you are hearing a party on the other side of the fence, you don't have to go over and hunt them. What you have to do is have a better party. Yeah, yeah create your own <laughs> party, man. And they ain't invited. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and because elk are tr- attracted to other elk, they're herd <laughs> animals. Right. No doubt, Joe. How many times you and I have been together and we hit a we hit a bugle or something like we're cow calling, got them coming, man, they're fixing up getting the bow range, and all of a sudden another bugle goes off and the bulls turn and go towards the other bugle, Joe. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? How Absolutely. many times have you seen that happen? Yeah. I mean, we look at each other and go, What the heck, man? The, those are bulls, right? They got big antlers and everything. You know, I mean, Joe. <laughs> They're going towards other bulls, leaving cows and going to bulls. I mean, they heard a party going on and they wanted to be part of it. Well, and and I want to add to that. So here's something. Here's a learning moment. So what Gilbert is talking about is we were actually in a perfect position where we had a bull with a group of cows. And and I'm telling you, if you can get yourself between a bull and his group of cows over. A, along that path, it's done. He's going to come on by and, and it's over. Well, all of a sudden we hear three other bulls bugling off in a direction away from us on the Half other mile. side of the bull. And this bull stops, turns his head with his cows going up the hill turns and starts going towards the bugles all right so everybody's going well why is that well let me tell you why that is so this bull is with a group of cows that he's basically just hanging with the cows there's no cow in heat He's just hanging with the cows. He's trying to gather up a little harem. He knows where they're going to bed down. But off to his right, which is further away from us, all of a sudden you hear three different bulls blowing up. One of them throwing out a lip ball bugle, right? And if you guys haven't heard that lip ball bugle, we'll demonstrate this for you here in a little while. But that lip ball bugle gets that raspy little type sound to the bugle in that well that's a display type bugle and that quick lip ball like that with these other bugles now throwing out challenge bugles around them what does that tell the bull that was with us right there's a cow in heat there's a cow in heat yeah there's a cow in heat right or maybe multiples right so here he is with a bunch of ladies but it ain't ready. It ain't ready. They're going to bed down. So they're going to bed. It's, it's, he, he's kind of a pimp or something. Yeah. He's a, with a bunch <laughs> of ladies no, and ex- absolutely. stuff. Yeah, kind of yeah. like that, Manano, but more like what Joe said, man. You know, got ones that are ready and the ones that are just talking like a bunch of hens. And he ain't ready for that. He's ready to go with the ones that are ready, you know. And he knows exactly where these other ladies are. He knows where they're bedding down. So he's taking off. Yeah. He's going to see if he has an opportunity to breed a cow. Exactly. And then he's going to come back or even cut some cows out and bring those cows over there. So mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. was everything that happened right there, right? It was an amazing, it was an amazing situation. Right. And one that was, it was heartbreaking because we worked so hard to get in position to get between him and the cows. And this is a big bull. This is not some little ragged. I mean, this is a big old bull. And we, we're, you know, he's 75 yards and closing the distance fast. He's, if he keeps on going where his cows were, he walk in 19 yards. I mean, it's a slam dunk. Wind is in our face. I mean, he's done. And he turns and goes the opposite direction. I look at Joe and I'm like, this is horrible, Joe. This is the worst luck I've ever seen. In life. I mean, I wanted, to, I wanted to break every arrow I had, break my bow in half. I mean, and you know what Joe did? Joe said, let's go. And we just took off and got right in behind him. And we climbed another mountain. 
<laughs> we did. We climbed another mountain. And we got right back in and we had opportunities, man. We did. Yep. Sure did. Got to draw my bow back, but just had some stuff in the way that wasn't good. Yep. I mean, I, then, I'll tell you of another heartbreak, man, that uh, me and Chad were on one time. Puff Hunt you know we're out there since before daylight we're going everywhere we're calling we're cow calling we're bugling we're doing all this stuff we're working our butts off and we come around and we're actually uh it's 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 <laughs> it's that point where everybody's you know it happens you slow down mentally and this is what we're trying to tell you this is what we were talking about before you start letting down mentally and we start talking as we're walking after we just got done doing a call set we come around a turn walking in a clearing in a flat open park and we're walking just like this kind of talking we look up and on the other side of the park three bulls come out and are walking straight at us haven't seen us they're walking straight at us and we're out there naked as a daggum jaybird not a tree right in the middle of the park <laughs> not the a park bush. they <laughs> did the only thing you can do is you you drop down and and you hope that and they keep coming they keep coming. They keep coming. I've got an arrow on. Chav has an arrow on. And we're like, we don't believe this. We don't worked our butt off. And we're going to sit here in the middle of the wide open. And these bulls are going to walk right on top of us. I couldn't believe they didn't see us in the first place. Hmm. And doggone if they're coming in, but they're head on on us as they're coming yeah. in at a distance that is not even a thought for a frontal, you mm -hmm. know. And so they're coming and they're coming. And they're probably 60 yards, Chav. <laughs> All of a sudden, they just... Yeah. They just stop, man. Just came to a screech, yeah. screechy stop. Because <laughs> there's not even not even a rock in the meadow. I mean, we were we stood out. <laughs> Y'all are the tallest thing. <laughs> oh yeah. It yeah. stuck out like a sore thumb. If, if there was lightning, bud, we were done for. You know, <laughs> man, we were yeah. the thing. And and what was funny is is it was like two of them peeled off and took off jogging out, and the third one was like, huh. <laughs> I mean, we were like, chap, let's kill the dumb one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah, the dumbest one that sticks around. Yeah. So the biggest amount of our calling, y'all, is scenario driven. So this is where we talk about trying to paint a picture right here. Okay. And so what do we mean by painting a picture of our calling? What we're saying is, is we want to bring in a bull with what he believes is another elk or a group of elk acting in a certain way that does not involve him. Not yet. Okay. Right. And, and that could be, and you might remember some of these. And I think you guys will hear these in your head a little bit as we talk about them. Like, for example, a group of cows or bulls that are just walking through an area. So if we're doing a group of cows or bulls that are walking through an area, you know, all we're doing is, is no contact muse. That's all we're doing, man. Yep. And, and we don't, you know, we throw a few out as we're moving. Our noise is given the, the idea that, you know, there's elk over there. Uh, a small herd, we do the same thing. But with that small herd, we might add some other type of noises to that. You know, um, a lone cow with a calf. So um, on our last video that we did on our Blue Collar Strong, if you guys want to hear what a calf elk sounds like, go watch our Blue Collar Strong. Yeah, we have, no doubt. We have Those two, two came elk. in super close. That little squeak coming into us, man. Yeah. And if you if you want to give the idea of of something and not intimidate a bull or any calf, calf sounds, man, because oh, yeah. mm -hmm. yeah, especially calves, especially curious, especially lost calves. Yeah. yeah. It uh, with that that repetitiveness and intensive, um, yeah, yeah. yeah cute sound. Yeah. It 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 will call in for aid and it will bring something in. <laughs> yeah, um, that's how we when we were when Luis killed his bull mm -hmm. year before last, we didn't call in the bull. 
We called in the cow that the bull was following. We called in the calf. Yeah. We called in the calf, yeah. And then the calf was followed by its mama. Yeah. And then the bull was following that mama. Yeah. Yep. And that's how it, it, it all kind of happened. So. Yep. so we weren't even talking to our target bull. It's a lot like guys when they're hunting turkeys and they want to get a tom in. You know, yep. a lot of times you don't call the tom, you call the hens. Exactly. Right? For sure. Um, or it could be a cow that has split off from a group in search where, we, you know, you like you're talking about that lost cow call or a bull that is tending cows. You can give that. So these are different things that we do within our scenarios to give an idea or paint a picture so the most important for you, thing for you guys to realize is non-engaging our scenarios are non-engaging they're not meant we can see a bull I mean, this, this is how we got Gilbert's bull. We look through the binos and we see, well, first of all, we hear him, I don't know what, a mile off, yes. three quarters of a mile, right? And we can see the bull in the binos and we put on a scenario, never screamed at that bull. We put on a scenario of a bull with a, with a, with a hot cow and we started acting like a cow that was in between that, what I call a pickle cow. You guys ever played pickle in baseball? You did. You know? Mm -hmm. So that cow that's in between right there, and man, that bull just kept on coming, man. He came from three quarters of a mile because we never screamed at him. We never bugled to him. We did a scenario to paint a different picture. And, and look, he, he had a barrier too, Joe, <laughs> and called him up a mountain. You yep. know, I mean, when we talk about painting a scenario, it was just him being curious where where was that hot cow you know and the curiosity killed the cat because i mean we made it sound like hey hey man, we're still up here buddy why don't you come on up here i mean he went and got in a wallow and then came up a mountain you know yep. and, i mean it took a while we almost bailed on him once because we didn't think he was going to come and then I heard some clunking going on down there. I said, Joe, man, I think I hear him. And I said, by God, Joe, I see him walking down there. And Joe's like, oh, well, all right. Let's go around and see how this goes, man. <laughs> you know, Joe, and then he just lost cow called two times. And that just, that incensed that bull. That bull couldn't handle that. He, I, I, think, I think a lot like human behavior, Joe, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's before you start painting your picture, though, you need to gather as much information as possible. I mean, I think that learning or at least understanding how many elk you're hearing and their mood and what they're sounding like and what they're saying prior to you building up that scenario is super important because, you know, it, it may, what you decide to do depends on, again, how many elk are there what are they sounding like you know what what are they doing the time of the year right so it's it's tough man and especially for somebody like you know us beginning well, and uh, okay. learning into this you know, this, this, is, this is not it's, oil it's, and okay. gas Luis. you're yeah, trying but, to plan the yeah stuff, if you look at it man. like that it can be really daunting but yeah. but from the way joe's broke this down is look i mean you did a location bugle you got an answer right you cow called, you got an answer, right? It don't matter if there's 13 bulls or 30 cows, you got an answer. So you keep yeah, but, uh, mimicking, that, pro you keep a, mimicking a, that profile. That's a little bit different deal. So generally when we're doing, what you're talking about Gilbert is, is when we get a response, we're reading the response and then we have to play off the response. So that's sure. generally engaging. Mm -hmm. That's either that's either one where we're, we're locating uh, where we're irritating, we're participating. Yeah. That's kind of what we're doing when we do that. But think about those times when, okay, here's two different types of situations where we're out in the morning and we know that there's a transition area that bulls like to go from feed to trees. Sure. Well, when we're going through there, we don't even know that there's an animal yet, but we're going to paint a picture like we are a herd, herd. Through yeah. Yeah. to bring some in, depending on the time of year. So we haven't even heard or seen anything yet. Or the situation that you're talking about, Luis, is mm -hmm. 
a lot of times when we do that, we are hearing animals off in a distance. Mm -hmm. um, and if they're in another GMU, if they're on private property, yeah. if they're over another place where we're not able to go, we don't have the option to go over and, and make any connections. So our only options are to be a half mile in or something like that. And then oh try to create a scenario right. to let them know. And what happens is, is anytime you have a party going on someplace, you know, what we can, you know, when we hear all those bugles going on, right? That yeah. means that there's going to be a herd bull, multiple herd bulls, multiple cows. And what that means also is there's going to be multiple satellites that are trying to get in on this action. Well, by us putting on our party, if any of those satellites are like, Man, this is just way too crowded for me, and I'm hearing another opportunity. Yeah, buddy. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. So they're like, well, I'm leaving this and going to that. Or what we have done is we have heard elk bugling as they're coming up, going to a destination. So what we start doing is acting like another dominant bull going to his destination up kind of paralleling. Right. And when we start sounding like that dominant bull, that's more dominant than the other bull with the groups of cows on the other. Remember, guys, who chooses who a cow breeds with? But when you are not engaging them and calling at them, when you sound like another group of elk, it's a totally different feeling for them because you're not engaging them. They are moving in a beeline because they want to go get with that group or find mm -hmm. out if they are going to be able to breed that hot cow, how many mature bulls are there, blah, 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 right? Depending, like you said, Luis, on time of year, that's critical. You know, whether it's early season, whether it's a uh, transition from, you know, pre-rut to rut, whether it's the rut, whether it's the postseason. Yeah, that, that stuff's important. But I believe that there are certain things that you can do that no matter whether it's early, transition, rut, or late, if you make it sound like there's a bull with a hot cow. Somebody's coming to look. Somebody's coming. I follow you. Yep. Right. Or. Coming to look. Yeah, man. And if I know that there are bulls out trying to gather cows, because I've seen that happening where they're trying to do that. And so I start to sound like a lone cow and a calf. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's see what that does. And here's what's great about this is if that doesn't push a button, change the painting. It doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't have to be that you're locked into yes. a scenario because here's the other thing that I said was I said that we're non-engaging. In other words, we're not meaning to engage our target animal. That is until he has escalated for engagement. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if I'm sounding like a bull and I'm pulling and, and, Guys, when we do the end of this series, we're going to give you some calls. We're going to do some some of these scenarios. I might even get some of the bros to join in with me. It might sound like a little party ourselves. Come on, man. You Let's know see. I can do it, Joe. Just see what happens, man. But uh, when you start getting that going, so I'm sounding like a bull. And and guys, look, when, when I'm sounding like a bull, when, when we're talking about engaging and not engaging, when I do this, when i do that man i'm like screaming right at a bull that's that's did you not hear it yeah no we, i'm we, sorry i got turned when, yeah. when i do that when i scream right at that son of a gun i'm like i'm engaged man mm -hmm. we're engaged right yeah but when that bull is hearing when he's hearing a cow whine and he's hearing some insistent pleads and then he's hearing that when he's hearing that and he starts hearing oh the glunking when he hears that it's not a bull engaging him it's a bull engaged in other activity man yeah, yeah. He, he's got a cow there right now but what if that bull then he comes in and all of a sudden he goes like all right well guess what all i do is this 
So I keep staying with mine because that bull has done a little bit of a round. He's trying to be irritating. He's trying to, you know, let me know he's there, letting the ladies know he's there. But he hasn't escalated yet. But what if that bull does this all of a sudden? He comes on my edge and he's like, (laughs) and he does that. Oh, guess what, man? Now it's time to escalate. Escalate. Now I'm going to escalate. Mm -hmm. Now I don't have to worry about the ladies Mm because he is already connected. Game Mm -hmm. is on. Now I can smack him in the face. So now I can engage that bull, right? And and one thing I want to mention, Joe, is that not necessarily – so we're not necessarily saying that you can – so don't use a screaming bugle as because it's engaging, but you can use the screaming bugles as painting a picture is still not engaging by yeah. Oh, yeah. given given you and I, for instance, That's, are yeah, in a situation a where we're screaming right at each other as yes. if you two are fighting, yeah. but then we're we're trying to bring a bystander Kinko. that wants to see what the heck is going on. Kinko. 100%. Absolutely, yeah. man. Because yeah. you and I did this where we started yeah. out as just making those noises, blah, blah, blah. I sounded like with the cows, with the bull. And we're going to talk about painting these layers. And we're going to talk about the palette in the second half of this. Y'all ain't going to want to miss this, man. I hope <laughs> we're giving you enough right now to let you know that the second half of this. Yeah, I mean, you and I did it for Chav. We call bulls across a barrier into us by us sounding like some fighting bulls up above them you know and with cows and everything else yeah by by putting that scenario but but what luis is talking about is if we sounded like if if all of us five got together chad was taking care of the cow calls back in the back you know uh, and look guys the hoochie mama i don't know if you know there's two things i want to say about Corey jacobson okay um, is that I hear people say all the time that Corey Jacobson, all he does is run the ridges and he screams until he finds a bugle bull that wants to fight. And then that's the one, the one that wants to play and he goes after it. Go watch Destination yeah, Elk, the yeah. third one, because Corey does everything from, I mean, he generally starting out near to far with cow calls. He'll just go cow call. He does whatever it takes to get a bull to answer. His goal is to find a bull that is going to answer and then play that bull. Yeah. And so he's not running around just screaming bugles. He, this dude is, I mean, he doesn't kill elk because he just goes around just screaming all the time. He goes around locating and yep. he'll try locating with location calls that are either cows or, or that are doing cow muse or they're doing bugles. He uses both of those, man. You know, so uh, the, the, the second thing that I want to say is as a professional elk caller, when he's on stage, one of Corey's tricks was he would be bugling and cow calling with his tube and squeezing a hoochie mama out of his back pocket yes. to sound like a herd, man. Yeah. So there's a, there's a place for all of that stuff to make that realism happen. But to your point, Luis, man, you got me so freaking excited. I'm fired up, man, now. Because <laughs> if, if there's three of us and what we do is and, and look, guys, if you're going to do this, you got to understand the concept of escalation. So if we're doing it and I'm sounding like an all of a sudden, Luis does like a little roundup bugle at at me and my cows, because that's the scenario. I'm like the dude with the cows and he's like the satellite bull and Gilbert's another satellite coming in. Right. And all of a sudden, uh, I, would, I would be a shooter. <laughs> You'd be a what, bro? Shooter. shooter. Oh, I just want to make sure you said shooter, man. I was yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. We understood something else. So you could uh, yeah, be that too. I could be a lucky again, man. <laughs> You're like, I thought everything was coming out the butt, man. So, <laughs> <laughs> No, you be the shooter, bro. That's exactly yeah. it. We'll do the story, man. And you yeah. Be- oh, yeah. Because Manano is a killer. He's an assassin. So <laughs> yes. if we're putting this on, we're sounding like it, and then we start escalating, and then Luis screams at me, and I cut him off. And then on the backside, Gilbert throws out a little short lip ball, mm-hmm. which is like a roundup to those ladies trying to pull him. When other bulls start hearing this stuff happening 
What is that message that goes out? So you want to come yeah. and check it out? Yeah. yeah. Boy's yeah. about to fight. Yeah. Something's about to go down. You got a cow call. It's whining. Little asterisk yeah. whining. You know, and, and, and have to say, we did this exact same thing yeah. you just described. Absolutely. All of us did when yeah. <laughs> that elk almost ran over Manano. Yeah. So <laughs> when Gilbert killed his first bull with me, that's exactly how I brought this bull in. Exactly. Uh, the, in fact, this bull, <laughs> this bull, uh, Carl Gamage, who was in the blind with Carl? Scott Deaton. Scott Deaton and Carl Gamage are in a blind with this bull coming to them and are going to seal the deal. And I'm down putting on a show down in the bottom. This bull turns and comes, comes from the direction he wanted to go down to us because he figured there was a hot cow in down there. And then he comes down and he sees the decoy. And it's over, man. Just like he's that. So he's coming up the hill then. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So that that's that is the perfect thing. We just gave everybody a taste of what we're getting ready to show them when we finish this off, man. Because uh when we talk about painting a picture, well, let me ask you before we get out of here, because we're getting close to shutdown time here. And guys, we have two questions in our mailbox that are going to end up going to our second part. So it's going to go to our, our next one. And, and just so I can give those names out there, we've got Tim from Canada and Scott Baker from Parker, Colorado that, uh, Oh, Scott, man. <laughs> yeah, man. we got a guy right Thank there you. who really recognizes a good leader. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> so the the thing that I wanna uh, that I wanna learn before we get into let's to paint, uh, let's learn to paint is let me ask you this: Is calling elk a science or an art? I think it's two parts. Both. In what way? Both. 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 Well, the science yeah. part of it is understanding the the language. Right. The artistry is is actually projecting the call painting on the surface yeah, yeah that, the, the creativity the art is the creativity that goes behind you creating a scenario yeah i mean you know most everybody can make got. a most everybody can make a, a cow sound. sound yeah yeah because when i think of science and chav you're you're a science teacher right so for every action there's supposed to be an equal or opposite reaction right so Mm. Or did I get that right, Chef? Uh, I'm not very. An uh, equal reaction. Yeah. <laughs> so, like I, said, like I said, everybody could probably make a mew, but can you can you give that mew some tone? Can you give it some texture? Can you give it, you know, can it, it's a different dialect, right? Everybody can be make a sound, but I, I've got my own tone, right? I, I talk sure. in a different dialect. Sure. I've got my own accent, sure. right? So being from where I'm at, so can you inflect that? And I think some of those things really triggers for elk too. Some of the best responsive, I've, best responses I've ever had is from some really low registered muse, right? Like, I mean, super low. And then boom, it just fires them up, you know? And, and that happened to be what was hitting them at the time, right? Yeah, so exactly. But when I when I think when I talk about the science with science is pretty straightforward when for every input there's an output. So in yeah. other words, if I if I hear this it means this and this is how I should respond, right? So um an elk makes a sound, what should be the proper response? Basically, that's the science of it, right? For but sure. When you're painting scenarios, when you're being an artist with it, you are creating the input and the output. You have a dynamic exchange of your own creation, all yours. You're creating the total environment. And mm -hmm. here's the thing I love about it is, you guys ever see Bob Ross before? Oh, yeah. Bob Ross, yeah, painting? Yeah, he's a heck of a painter. Oh, yeah. man, it, it, look, he looks Venezuelan. I don't know why you guys haven't seen him, man. <laughs> but Bob Ross, his whole thing was when he paints, you don't worry about accidents. He, right. They're happy accidents. Yeah. They, they give artistry to the painting. And it's the same thing when you're calling out. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're throwing out these views and when you're throwing out the bugle, they, 
they can sound different. They can have inflections. They can have different feeling. That's the artistry of it. Because if you've ever listened to a group of elk, man, all those tones and stuff are so different, man. So mm. that's- Hey, Joe, I just pulled up a picture. Couple. I just pulled up a picture of him. And actually, <laughs> you, if you let your afro grow, you're going to look a lot like him, dude. <laughs> <laughs> no. I got to work on my Spanish then, bro. Look like like I said, man. It's really about first of all the science part of it, speaking the language, and then you know, then like you said, Joe, mm-hmm. painting your painting your picture with the call. And look, I'm going to tell y'all right now, some of the worst sounding bulls I've ever heard in my life bugle were real, and I was like, man. Way that's daggum elk caught talking, right? Some of the uh, some of the weirdest sounding cows, um, they make different sounds, you know. And if you can be in the situation and understand what they need, enough said. But I think I, I think a lot, you know. And I'm I'm this guy, man. If I can get in the herd and see the elk, uh, it's so much easier to paint that picture, right? Because then I can see him visually, right? And um, for me, uh, I rely so much on my sight and, and, and then listening to what's going on. And uh, for me, being as silent as you can is, is there's, there's an artistry to that too, you know, yep. and that's just being a good woodsman and stuff like that, understanding oh, the, sure. the flow of the herd, where to go cut them off. Uh, and, and a lot of that has to do with, knowing your terrain too, knowing where they're going to go. You know, when I killed that bull, Joe, you knew exactly where he was headed. And we were not in position to kill that bull at the time. We had to, we had to sprint for a long way to get into position, but you knew exactly where he was going. And we didn't even get set up right in the bulls already in position to where he corner. Was. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. He was yep. turning the corner and here he come, you know, but it was because you knew that area so well yeah. and, and the, the okay. habits of that elk, you know, and look, he'd been screaming at us for a couple of days up there, you know, and we knew that. Oh uh, yeah. We made our decision that we were going to live or die in that area. And uh, yeah, that, that bull wasn't even coming to us. He was actually coming over there to Mr. Gamage and we turned him, Joe turned him around and sent him the other direction. You know, for, for me, calling has been an evolution and I really got uh, a full fledge of it this year hunting with Brendan the first few days, you know, we actually jumped a bull and he was silent. We actually jumped him. I'm sure what had I made some of those sounds earlier, he was probably coming to those sounds that I'd made, but he came in silent. So we jumped him and he didn't really understand what we were. And he ran out there, I don't know, 80 yards. And I turned him around six or seven times and brought him within, you know, 38 yards is the closest we got him. You know, but I brought him back like five or six times. So when you're doing the right things and so much of it's experience, Joe, you know, so what we're giving our view listeners right now can cut that, that experience level in half and just understanding the scenarios we're giving them, they'll be able to go out in the woods and understand number one, the science part, and then they can actually work at home on making the, the right sounds, but I don't, I don't necessarily think you, you're going to make the wrong sounds. You know, if you can do the basic stuff, man, you, you can make it happen. Absolutely, man. So guys, next week, when we come back, let's learn to paint. We're going to teach you how to know your palette. We're going to teach you what your palette is. Uh, We're going to tell you about how to pick your canvas. And then we're going to talk about, Um, how to pick the type of picture that you want to paint, exactly what Luis was talking about there, and get you to understand the differences um, in the different places, the different times, the different ways, and and some of these decisions you make. And again, understand that, and I'm just telling you right now, just because you make one decision doesn't mean that that's not going to evolve and change. Uh, so we're going to leave that with you and, uh, next week we're going to finish this off and we'll hit our Elk Rose mailbox. 
Yeah, buddy. Hey, guys, if you like what we're doing, please subscribe, rate, and review us. You got to go to Apple Podcasts or iTunes to review us, and you can check out more elk hunting content at elkbros.com. And as a reminder, again, if you if any of our listeners would like our, their questions answered on our show, just send your questions to info at elkbros.com. That's info at elkbros.com. Every week we get in some uh some some mail from the guys that are out there asking us questions joe it's been fantastic to to be able to engage with our listeners uh i feel blessed to, to be able to do that you know got some really good uh feedback from paul snowart this week and and several different of our uh different uh listeners that have have emailed myself i'm sure luis as well uh and joe joe's always cool to say hey man check this out you know and i'm, I'm always going to send an email back guys it's one of my pet peeves if you email me and i haven't emailed you um that's simply because we had our internet down down here for almost four days so uh it, i will get back to every one of them that has emailed to us so we appreciate all our listeners out there and all our i've been, uh, I've been replying in between light breaks Whenever we had the lights on on the computer, sent yeah. a couple email outs, and then you know lights out again. And I tell you what, Joe, too, it's a, it's affected our our cell phones down here too. I barely get one or two bars, so yes. um, I apologize. I, I, even tonight, we had a, a break in the in the system, so finally got it repaired and got back on where we could get to doing what what we do best, which is talk about elk hunting and and look one of the best elk callers in the world. You guys saw it on episode uh, 100, and you guys saw it on, on our blue collar elk hunting where we had our last uh, uh, promises kept uh, up there on the mountain. Joe called in a herd of bulls up there in that set. I mean, it was crazy. You know, uh, this guy's one of the best elk callers in the world. Learning from him is unbelievable. Y'all are not going to want to miss the show next week for sure. Guys, as always, unbelievable to see y'all. Can't wait for next week. Like we say down here in the Lone Star State, fellas, you better cover up and stay warm. But husbands, <laughs> kiss your wives. Wives, kiss your husbands. Hug your babies. Keep your broad heads sharp and your powder dry. And we'll see you next week right here on Blue Collar Elk Hunting. Peace, peace. Peace. Peace.